Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero, and as this episode should be coming out on the 25th, Merry Christmas! Well, I've had this idea that's been floating around in my head for the past term that came up after a column that Lee Alexander did for Gamma Sutra. It was not so much a column as a review of Grand Theft Auto V, which is very well written, and I'll try to remember to put a link to it in the show notes, slash doobly-doo down here. Um, but it got me thinking, which a good review should do. In the review, she talks about Grand Theft Auto V and how, basically, while the game has a whole lot of narrative freedom and creative freedom to it that you can do, or you know, the sandbox game, you can run around and do almost any anything, she found herself getting broken out of the game and bumped out of absorption once she started really hitting the walls of what you can and cannot do. Um, she describes basically trying to have, trying to get with one of the one of the characters trying to escape the very destructive life he's in, um, with a unsatisfying home life and him after trying to leave a life of crime, getting sucked back into it, and trying to leave the game world and basically reaching a point where she couldn't go any further. Um. And, and thus, in spite of the world being wide and expansive and open, ultimately still feeling restrictive, and in a way feeling more restrictive because of all that you can't do in spite of what you can do. And it's got me thinking. There's this concept when it comes to depictions of artificial humans, whether in terms of animation or in terms of things like... Um, well, Android, uh, of Android's robots and that sort of thing called the Uncanny Valley. You've probably heard of this. It's a fairly well-known concept. Um, but the idea is, there's a point where a simulated human is too real to be just perceived as a construct, an artificial, artificial organism, artificial being, but is not real enough to be considered to, to come across as alive. The example that's given in the di- in most diagrams for the point where you hit the, the base of the valley, of the Uncali Valley, is like corpses, if it's stationary, or zombies, if it's animated. And it kind of triggers your psychological, the same psychological response that you have when you see something that's dead. It creeps you out, and weirds you out, and freaks you out. Um, and I think a similar idea can be applied to ne- to freedom in video games through narrative and through gameplay. At the far left of the graph, I'm actually going to try and, like, over here, put the graph. There, it's on Wikipedia. On the far left is games like Donkey Kong. There's no real freedom of exploration. There aren't really that many secrets in the game. You just go through the same rote series every time. Um, your actions that you may do maybe different than another player's actions. You may jump where another player doesn't. Um, you may encounter a barrel at a point where another car- player didn't encounter a barrel. But it's pretty much the same thing. Um, next up, as, as we proceed further to the right, we start getting into games like like the Hedgehog, like Castlevania 3, where, we have a, where there's freedom of exploration. There's new routes you can take in a game based on the decisions that you make and abilities you have and that sort of thing. You can choose, <clears throat> like, going not quite all the way to the left, but more free than Donkey Kong. We have things like Mario, like Super Mario Brothers. You can take alternate routes through levels. You can choose to go down through a pipe and collect a bunch of coins, but not fight a bunch of enemies and not collect one up. And not collect a uh, some, some of the power-ups that you could have gotten by then. Uh, for example... Okay, yeah, great example. World 1. It's Mario Brothers. You go down the pipe, you can get a whole bunch of coins. Get you further along towards getting a 1-up that way. You can even, you're careful, get the 1-up that's over there and still go down the pipe and get the coins. It'll be hidden 1-up. By the way, hidden things that you can find for further exploration. But if you don't go down that pipe and keep going further along at the top level of the, uh, top portion of the level, you can get the Fire Flower, 
in the first level. Whereas otherwise, if you go down the pipe, you can't get the fire flower until the next level. An example. Um, as we go further along, you get the things like the Metroidvania type games. Where you have a fairly expansive world to explore, and you can go through it pretty much at your own pace. There are certain places where you need to get certain items to progress and go through these areas. But they don't explicitly say, oh, you must have this item to go through here. You learn through experimentation and exploration where you can or cannot go, and what you need to go through certain areas. Um, Legend of Zelda, similar sort of thing. You learn through experimentation and exploration that you need the that you need the bridge to get through certain areas, or you need the raft to access certain points, and some more things like that. And then further along, as we get closer to the crest, we get to games like Mass Effect, games like Baldur's Gate, all these going to tend on the side of the role-playing game, where you have a lot of freedom to customize your character, to explore, and to choose different narrative options, and much more control over the story. And that's where we start getting, when we get to the far right, to the far, far right of this, as we start getting into freedom of narrative combined with freedom of exploration. With Baldur's Gate, you can choose any number of dialogue options with characters. You choose who, what your character is going to be like. Is he going to romance? Is he or she going to romance a character? Are they going to romance no one? Are they going to be antagonistic to everyone? Are they going to go it alone? And even though this game is designed with a party in mind, are they just going to basically reject everyone who the plot doesn't force to come along with you? And just solo the whole game. Um, and also, there's a control, there's a new control on your, over your abilities. Are you a mage? Are you a cleric? Um, basically, do you use magic? Do you not use magic? If you don't use magic, are you a sneaky character or are you a wade into the front of combat type character? That sort of thing. These all control how, how you play the game and, or what, and thus the freedom of how you play, what, um, and what you do when you're playing. And that's how the story unfolds for you. Once we get to, like, the Grand Theft Auto games, then we start getting to, and, like, the more recent Grand Theft Auto games where you have a wide variety of side missions and that sort of thing. That's where we start getting into the, the, I guess, the difficulties that, um, Lee Alexander mentioned in terms of, I have all this freedom to theoretically create my own story in this game. But I can't necessarily create the story I want to create because I'm running into the restrictions of what the developer has created for this game, and thus what I'm able to do in this game. And this was like getting to the base of the valley, where you have a world which feels like you can do anything until you start pushing the boundaries and discover you can't do anything. You can't do very much at all. Now I use for the older for the stuff further to the left a lot of older games examples. There are more recent games with similar sorts of things. Your Call of Duties are fairly narratively focused. There are, isn't much room for exploration. You can wander around and grab collectibles, grab intelligence. You can choose what gun you want to use and how to fix your play style. But when all is said and done, most players have the same experience every time. It's about at the Mario Brothers level of freedom on here. So, to be clear, while I'm using retro games as examples, you can apply, you can place modern games further to the left of the graph than, uh, in addition to putting more modern games further to the right, and it's just in the same way, but some modern games, or some older games, fairly far to the right as well. So, with Uncanny Valley, it is a valley, it is not the uncanny, uncanny bottomless pit. So how do you get out of the Uncanny Valley? Well, create a, user created content and a way to distribute it. The idea behind being in Kelly Valley is the user feels trapped in a story that, they, that doesn't let them expand on it to tell their own story. And so, by giving options for users to create their own stories and perhaps even drop them into the larger game and tell them what their own characters, whether it's the characters from the game itself, from the main game story, or a new character of their own choosing, 
that's where we start coming out of this. And the further to the right we get, coming out of, the, out of this is based around how user-friendly these tools are to use, while also how much freedom they give you. Gain, um, and this doesn't mean anyone can create War and Peace either. For example, well, Little Big Planet. Little Big Planet 1 and 2, their user-created content systems, give players massive amounts of freedom to create anything and everything. Little Big Planet One was designed as a plat designed to be a platformer, a fairly floaty platformer, but a platformer with a level editor. Users created it to make a kart racer and a shooter. The point that when they did Little Big Planet Two, they had kart racing and shooting stuff in the levels who in like the trailers for the game because they knew that users could create that, created that before, so obviously people can create it now. It's kind of extraordinary. Um, games like Neverwinter Nights and the most recent Shadowrun Returns are other similar examples of this. The key difference here is we have a certain degree of limitations related to what tools and assets are in the game system, in the system for what you can and cannot do. And basically, I'd say the farthest to the right example on um, the graph they use ordinary hum a human passing or passing for human for the farthest to the right, once you've emerged from the Uncanny Valley, farthest to the right would be basically indistinguishable from a tabletop role-playing game. Because, honestly, when all said and done, a tabletop role-playing game gives... Um, they give players more or less infinite freedom to tell the story they want to tell with together as a group within the bounds of the rule system they're using. And the rule system... <coughs> excuse me. The rule system really is essentially a, a, a agreement to a bunch of genre conventions for a tabletop role-playing game. If I play, for example, Conan, one of the Conan role-playing games, or one of the old D&D retro clones, <coughs> editing that out, one of the D&D retro clones, I am making the implicit genre assumption I'm doing a sort of fantasy freaking Vietnam, grim and gritty take on tabletop role playing game. Uh, not just tabletop role, role playing games, but grim and gritty tabletop story. You know, there are terrible, horrible things that go bump in the night out and out in, out there in the world, and they can totally kick, kill the hell, kill the hell out of me, out of my character, or my part, my party members. And so it's meant to be a very tense, very dangerous story. Compare that to Dungeons and Dragons Fourth Edition. Compare that to if I'm running a more cinem like uh, big eyes small mouth fantasy setting, it can be more high powered. It can be sort of closer to the the Slayer's take on fantasy, where where the scope is epic and characters are capable of doing great mighty heroic deeds and can theoretically rip through a whole bunch of army of like armies of monsters that would be more dangerous in a tradition in a grim and gritty old school D D setting or a Conan type setting. But for him but for him or her, for them, the characters can rip through them, but the threats they face face as a consequence are more dangerous and more dramatic and threaten the whole and perhaps more world spanning. So like I said, a system is genre conventions and thus and so much as a role-playing game system, when you sit down to play Shadowrun, you're sitting down to decide, okay, we're playing a science fiction game with magic in it, a science fantasy game, with cyberpunk genre conventions set in the future, it's kind of going to be heisty and all this other sort of stuff. There's a whole bunch of things that you could come with being Shadowrun. In the same way, if Max Payne 4 has the like, full set of mod tools, level level editor, stuff to let you create your own levels, do cutscenes, all those sorts of things. Basically, if Max Payne 4 is all the way to the far right, coming out of the narrative Uncanny Valley for video games, it comes in with the set of explicit or implicit genre conventions of this is a Max Payne game, it's taking cues from the heroic bloodshed genre of um, action film, 
stuff like John Woo and that sort of thing, it's it's going to be noir heavy. It's going to be our results. Going, our results going to have cinematic action, and it's going to be set in the re, in the modern real world. It's not going to be science fiction. It's not going to be set in the far future. All that sort of thing. Um, so that's the idea there. Now, this doesn't mean that people who that, that by opening things up to this much user created content, it's not going to necessarily kill game developers or that sort of thing. I mean, companies like Steve Jackson Games, companies like White Wolf, companies like Wizards of the Coast and Paizo have done incredibly well making content to expand tabletop role-playing games. Whether it's pre-written adventures, like the Adventure Path that Paizo is making a lot of money doing, or, for that matter, um, basically the Splat books, books which expand the options that, char- that players have, a- have available to tell their stories, players and game masters have available to tell stories cooperatively. The same thing could be done with with um, video games. For example, art asset packs. I mean, with um, with Little Big Planet, they had packs of new stickers that could be used to flesh out your environments and make and change the things that depict in your environments. There's new costumes for your uh, sack boys, and you could do similar sorts of things with role-playing with uh, video games and mod kits. Okay. Let's say, for example, Max Payne 4... Max is in London now. Or Max is in <clears throat> Moscow. He's in, Max is in Russia. Um, maybe he goes to... I, just forget, just ignore the narrative reasons. Let's just say Max Payne 4 is set in Russia. And we're narratively exploring... The current state of modern Russia in the the um, in Max Payne Four in the same way that Max Payne Three explored the dichotomy of the rich elite of Brazil with the lower class and the favelas and the, the lower income pe- lower income classes and the favelas and that sort of thing. But let's say you still want to tell your like City of God level um, narrative story in Max Payne Three. Well, then the develop then Rockstar because Rockstar's the publisher, Max Payne, Rockstar puts out a mod expansion pack with all the assets you need to create stuff for Brazil. Um, it has skyboxes. It has textures for walls, whether for favela stuff or for big city stuff. Um, it gives you some characters... Appearance, some stock characters you can use. It basically gives you like a whole bunch of Max Payne 3 art assets. It'll cost you a bunch of money. Let's say it costs you 50 bucks. Um, or maybe, maybe a little less because it's just the assets. It doesn't come with the story with it. You just buy the assets, maybe like 30 bucks. And you can do the, he- the he- whatever the heck you want with it. Um, you got that. Um, if you, then maybe they offer a story with it as well. Like, what happened to cause Max to leave uh, Brazil after the end of the last game and, and leave Brazil and go to Moscow? That's. That, that version costs you 60, costs you 50 bucks or whatever. So you get the assets and you get a story to tell with it. The story that's being told with them. And that sort of thing. And ideally, what you could also do with this, particularly, for example, with stuff on the PC, with what's being done with Steam um, Workshop, is you can use that to distribute your story. Whether it's like how Skyrim uh, mods are being uh, distributed with Skyrim, or new user-created missions are being distributed with Shadowrun Returns, or whatever. whatever. Similar things being done with Never with the Neverwinter MMO, where they have the workshop, or what they call the Foundry in there, and... They encourage people to play the user-created content in-game by, hey, you get actual diamonds for doing the user-created content, which is awesome. And honestly, not all user-created content is going to be able to compete with the stuff being made professionally and people are paying for. I'm... Hell. Any, like, D&D, with the three world books, anybody can create an adventure for Dungeons & Dragons. 
and I mean, lots of and lots of people created on adventures. There's all the stories of people who had their you know, GM is tossing out plus five Holy Avengers like they were Halloween candy, uh, making it rain gold pieces, and so forth. It's on all the Monty Hall campaigns, in addition to the really grim, really lethal, um, backstabby D&D campaigns where it, where the GM was getting like a total party kill every couple sessions. And it, even though those were coming out, people were making those and sharing them with their friends across the United States, and even the world, TSR was still putting out stuff like Secret of Bone Hill, um, Tomb of Horrors, Against the Giants, actually the whole Against the Giants vaults of the um, Descent to the Underdark vaults of the Drow Path, um, was basically the first real adventure path in role-playing. That whole thing, I mean, that sold really well. It sold well that TSR was able to keep reprinting it, and when they were bought out by Wizards of the Coast, they... Re, they kept remaking it for new systems because people loved it. And consequently, stuff made by professional developers will be able to compete very successfully with the stuff coming out by Joe Average and being distributed through Steam Workshop. I mean, if for Borderlands 3, there's a complete mod kit that lets you make, create your own levels, create your own stories, do your own narration even, or what have you, or perhaps having a sort of syllable pack, allowing you to create your own, um, use the voices from the game to create dialogue, much as with, like, um, some of the stuff that was going on with Portal, where they had the syllables and stuff, so you could basically create your own Galato-style narration. Um, even though it wasn't, didn't necessarily have the same character stuff that was directly recorded for the game. You could do all that, but it's not going to compete with the stuff that's being made professionally. Stuff like, for Borderlands 1, the Armory of General Knox, um, similar stuff for Borderlands 2. Um, I'm blanking on uh, some some of the expansions. There was the uh, Tiny Tina's. Um, yeah, they have the Tiny Tina expansion, which is oddly and uh, which is oddly enough based off running a role playing game. All that other sort of stuff. Now, this concept that I'm talking about is kind of pie in the sky. I mean, we're getting there. We have stuff like. Shutter and Returns ed, uh, workshop and editor. We have the editing tools for Skyrim, but we're not quite at the point where on uh, where we have where really it's totally user friendly. I mean, it's to take to create a story. It's it's difficult. It's, I mean, it's, for people who are gotten used to tools and have learned it, like, oh, hey, it's easy, anyone can do this. It, it, it takes a bit more time and investment than it would to create a story in a tabletop role-playing game. And also bears mentioning as far as, for how would this complete with tabletop role-playing games? I mean, most of what these adventures you're creating, people are creating for Skyrim, for Shutter Returns, are being taught and played solo. And additionally, the thing with tabletop role-playing games is you can create a story completely on the fly for with any system. You can do this with Pathfinder, with um, Fate, Rules Heavy, Rules Light. You can get, like, generally, with enough grasp of the rules, you can just completely, like, wing it. And just as long as the treasure distribution works out fairly well, and... In, in terms of the, the game doesn't go, oh, you all find Holy Avengers. Um, it, yeah, basically the good GM, you can tell really good stories on the fly. The good GM can tell a good story on the fly without necessarily having to had plot and it, plotted everything out in advance and that sort of thing. Good prep helps. Good prep really helps. But the point is, that's something that probably wouldn't necessarily work very well for computer games in terms of for the, the mod kits and you to create content and that sort of thing. But that said, we're getting there, and as it is with the complexity of modern modding tools, it does also serve the purpose of helping train the next le level and next tier of game developers, people telling stories in video games. So, 
we got that going for us. And I covered my bits on this one. There's another thing that Lee Alexander did with uh, retweeting a conference. Um, I'll have to do some research on what that conference was and who it, uh, the, the, the speaker at that uh, presentation was. So I can properly put together a, vlo a vlog on that. But I'll get to that at some point in the future. Plus I've read some books lately. And who knows, maybe we'll get something really cool for Christmas to talk about. So, until then, I'm Count Zero. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Click subscribe if you'd like to know when my next content comes out, whether it's Nintendo Power Retrospectives, or another one of these, or my next let Let's Play. And, you know, hey, if you, if you think that my camera is really cruddy, if you'd like me to shoot in a better environment, I mean, I'm working off a of buck 95 and a ham sandwich, if you want to, oh, there's a tip jar right up there. If you want to help get tossed in a few, if you feel like you want to toss in a few bucks, go for it. If you don't, I'm not complaining. I'm not too worried. I'll see you next time.